Welcome to Jamestown. Rambling Jack Kelly. Let's ramble here in Jamestown now. Now this one in there. Rodeo and Wild West show. Yep. And the headquarters, their home ranch was in Waverly, New York. Was that part of the Jim Eskew? Yes, sir. Colonel Jim Eskew. Colonel Jim Eskew. Well, what was and, he like? <laughs> well, I never got to know Colonel Jim very well. He was he was my boss, but I didn't get to talk to him very much. And I was on the show for approximately three months. My parents didn't know where I was. I was, I was a runaway. One day he received a letter from my dad with my picture and it was uh, a description that was printed up by the Missing Persons Bureau. <laughs> but they weren't doing much help. He had to do all the mailing, you know, and he, he figured I might be on a ranch. So he mailed that information out to a lot of rodeo companies and ranches all over the place. And one of them arrived at the J.E. Ranch. And I don't think my dad ever heard me talking about the J.E. Ranch, but I, as a young rodeo fan from the age of nine, yeah. they made the mistake of bringing me the rodeo at Madison Square Garden when I was nine. I ran away from home when I was 15. I'd been reading Will James books and going to the rodeo in Madison Square Garden every year since I was nine years old. Never missed rodeo. And one day I find myself hitchhiking and I got a ride in a truck that was going to North Carolina coming through Washington DC I saw a big sign that said J.E. Ranch Rodeo at the U-Line Arena I thought I'm gonna go over there and see that I I knew all about it I had read about Colonel Jim never saw his show I'd only seen the rodeo in Madison Square Garden but that was a great rodeo I took a taxi over to the U-Line Arena, got a job grooming horses, two dollars a day. And they said, what's your name? And I told them my name and they couldn't pronounce it. And they said, we'll call you, we'll call you Pancho. Pancho. After a beloved clown that used to drink a lot of wine and let the bulls throw him around, never got hurt, stayed loose. And Rick and I, on a visit to uh, Waverly on, on a way to Montana in a little old motor home that I was barely, it was on its last wheels, had no brakes, and it had three-year-old expired license plates, and we drove it all the way from Connecticut to Montana on back roads. No brakes at all. Well, there's a little bit of mechanical break if you put your foot all the way to the floor. We never had any uh, accidents with the rig. I was selling it to a friend of mine in Montana for very little money. It wasn't worth much. Uh, we stopped at Waverly to visit the old J.E. Ranch, or what's left of it. And there wasn't much there, but there were some buildings. And we found an empty bottle that must have contained rum or brandy or something like that and it was sort of in between the logs of the cabin where I used to sleep and it was half full of dust that had trickled in from the air it had about two inches of dust in the bottom of this pint liquor bottle and the main house is still there I think I don't remember if the big barn was still up but they had a bunch of steel dust quarter horses. They bred quarter horses and sold sold a few. They must have had about 50 or 60 bucking bulls and 40 or 50 bucking horses and about 100 steers and maybe 100 calves for calf roping. And they'd lay over there for several weeks in between shows and stuff. And we met old Mr. O'Brien, who was the man who bankrolled Colonel Jim and brought him from Texas and bought him the land to set him up with the ranch there so that they could produce that rodeo. And it was reputed to be the one of the only reputable 
uh, professional RCA rodeos east of the Mississippi River. Just to let you know where you are, you're here in Jamestown, New York, next to Gary, New York, and the Gary Rodeo is the longest running rodeo east of the Mississippi, five miles from here. And I was just looking in the history, and in 1945, Jim Eskews came here. Maybe you did too. Well, I was on, on that show in 1947, and it was probably later in the summer of 47, or maybe perhaps a year later in 48, that I hitchhiked up here to Geary, New York, just to see my old friends in the, in the J.E. Ranch Rodeo. I remember one of my co-workers in the tent with about eight, sleeping in a tent with 60 horses, six of whom were my responsibility. And I didn't even own a sleeping bag. I used saddle blankets to sleep. We were playing in Pittsburgh for 10 days with indoor rodeo. We went by train from Washington, D.C. to Pittsburgh, truck in a rainstorm back to the ranch, and then I spent the remainder of two, two and a half months on the ranch. One day, Colonel Jim called me over to the house and showed me my photograph. He says, is this your picture, Poncho? I said, yeah, Colonel Jim, that's me, all right. It was a very ugly picture of myself in a little sailboat. <laughs> Says, why didn't you tell me you was a runaway? If I'd have known you was a runaway, I wouldn't have hired you. I said, maybe that's why I didn't tell you. <laughs> we left it at that. But one of the clowns, there were two clowns on that J.E. Ranch Rodeo, lost John Crithers, and he had a little boy who was just a baby then, Punky, who grew up to be a bull rider. And uh, the other clown was uh, played banjo privately and back in the stands. And we'd put a quarter in his hat. He'd sing songs wow. to us. His name was uh, Bramer Rogers. And he had a trained Bramer bull named Henry. Oh, I'm sorry. No, that's a third party. That was a guy from Florida. In fact, he gave me a ride when I was hitchhiking with that bull in the trailer. I remember I was so soaking wet from the rainstorm that uh, there was a big puddle under me where I sat in his pickup truck. And it was him and his wife and me in the pickup truck. And that was how I got to the ranch. Because the, the truck I was riding in stopped the driver was going to take a nap and I wanted to keep going. He was my first uh, inspiration to want to play the guitar. And when I got home from that trip, oh, the other clown, Lost John Crothers, gave me a cigar. It was a King Edward cigar. They're worth about 50 cents, I believe. Uh, he gave me my first cigar and he says, you know, we sat down, but outside the cookhouse he said you know poncho if you go back home and you finish up your high school education and get your diploma you can do anything in the world you want to do including cowboy I mean, you might stay here you might like being a cowboy you might not like being a cowboy write your folks a letter I wrote him a letter and told him I'm coming home. And I took a bus back to New York City, 400 miles. And they welcomed me home and said they'd feed me uh, until I graduated high school. So I stuck with it. It took me about four different high schools before I could get through to, you know, getting a diploma, because I wasn't a very good student. I was all, I started practicing the guitar. I was hanging out and playing guitar with a fellow named Tom Paley and others. There was a group of about 20 or so that played really well on guitars, fiddles, and banjos. Uh, bluegrass style was trickling into New York City with those guys around Sunday afternoon in Washington Square Park.
a fellow named Tom Paley knew Woody, gave me Woody's phone number. So I called Woody up one day. I said, hey, I've been listening to your music on record. I play a little bit of guitar myself. I've been playing for, I think I'd been playing guitar for three years by that time. It was 1951. Yeah, almost four years of guitar playing. And I said, Tom gave me your number. And uh, I told him that I'd worked on the J.E. Ranch Rodeo and it was a rodeo clown that got me kind of started in this music thing, singing them songs. And he said, well, come on over, bring your guitar and we'll knock off a couple of tunes. I don't come today though, I got a belly ache. <laughs> okay, so I said, well, I hope you feel better and I hung up. I was 19 then, Woody was 39. I, I waited a couple of days for him to make, hopefully, you know, feel better. And I called two or three days later and his wife, Marjorie, answered and she said, Woody was in the hospital, he had a p ruptured appendix, oh my gosh. almost died. So I asked her if I could go visit him and she said, oh no, he's all doped up on pain pills and he's not making much sense. He's in a lot of pain, blah, blah. So I waited another day or two and then I just went. I figured he's gotta be better by now. And I showed up at the hospital, it was right across the street from where they lived. And uh, in fact, it was a building that was owned by the Donald Trump family, Donald Trump's father. And uh, I didn't know anything about the owners. And uh, it was called Beach Haven Apartments because I brought my guitar to the hospital there and Woody says, don't make any noise. The guy on the other bed just got off the operating table. But if you go to the window and you look out there, you'll see my kids playing on the back porch. That's our new apartment. They just left their old place in Coney Island. They never got to see that place. That was on uh, <coughs> 3520 Mermaid Avenue. I never got to see that apartment. <coughs> so he said, go across the street and uh, you know, introduce yourself to my wife. She'll show you around. So I just went over there and said, hi, I'm the guy that called on the phone the other day. She was so happy to show, show me their new apartment. And it was a nice place. And uh, I never got to see the old place where his daughter got burned in a fire. Sad memories. But uh, Woody had a lot of bad luck and tragedies in his life. And, spent about two and a half years living with the Guthrie's. I was the babysitter. Oh, really? Uh, it wasn't a hard job. And I, we got to play a lot of music and I heard a lot of stories. And we drove around with the kids in the back seat, sightseeing on the Belt Parkway mostly, and telling stories. Cisco Houston came by to visit a couple of times and they sang in the car, I was the only one listening. Wow, what, what interesting. I, we didn't have the kids with us that time. It was just me and Woody and Cisco. And I'd never met Cisco before. I was so thrilled because Cisco was his old recording partner. And they really sounded good together for a couple of years. Did some nice recording. Did you ever get involved in doing any of the recording during that time period with Woody? I went with Woody. To, we did some recording privately on his Webcore, Webster Chicago, little home, home tape recorder. And I've heard only one or two songs from that entire, I don't know how many reels of tape that we had of Woody and me together. But he, when he went to DECA to record an album. I was with him. I was standing six feet away the first time he recorded a song purely as a talking blues, it didn't have a melody. And then uh, somebody else, uh, some kid in the Midwest, I think, made up a, a melody for it and submitted it to Sing Out magazine. 
and uh, Cisco Houston recorded it. He was just beginning to show the symptoms of the Huntington's chorea, which is a disease that finally took him out, but he lived 13 years with that horrible disease. Most patients that have it usually die in three or four years. He, ha he hung on for 13 years, and he was wheelchair-bound for the last uh, seven or eight years or so, wheelchair-bound, couldn't even hold a cigarette in his fingers. Exhibit behind you here on Lenny Bruce. The yeah, Lenny Bruce. I saw Lenny Bruce one time at a hotel in San Francisco <clears throat> where he was staying. And he was using the wall like a telephone, public tele pay phone in the lobby. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> the Swiss American Hotel on Broadway. Talking to a lawyer in Chicago for an hour. I don't know how many quarters he put in that telephone. <laughs> And he was performing in a nightclub around the corner, and I got to see that show. That was my first time seeing him. And I saw him once in Chicago and several times in New York. Gave him a ride in my car one time. He looked like he really needed a ride. He was barely able to walk. He was under the effect of some drug. And I'd seen him perform three or four times by that point. But I assumed that he didn't know who I was and I wasn't gonna bore him with any talk. I just got him in the back seat of the car. He needed to ride to his hotel. He told me how to get there. It was only about two blocks away in the village. I think it was on 8th Street. I guided him into the hotel. The desk clerk nodded to him because he knew him. And I escorted him to the entrance of the elevator. He stepped in, the door closed, and I took off. And he later, many years later, I visited him at his home. He remembered each and every time that I was in the audience. Very controversial then and now, but yeah. did you get a sense of that then? Uh, only because of the grim sarcasm and uh, the stuff that he was talking about was pretty sad and pretty sorry and pretty scary <clears throat> but every once in a while it would appear to be funny too he had invented a new way to to share his feelings about society now there's Woody Guthrie there's Jack Elliott who was with Woody Guthrie for two years Arlo Guthrie learning about his dad really through you. It's like there was a father-son relationship between you and Arlo. A little bit. Yeah. I know I did, uh, so I'm embarrassed to listen to it. In one record I did a song, Go to Sleep Little Arlo, <laughs> one of Woody's songs. And then I proceeded to tease Arlo uh, in a kind of a rough way, like an elder brother would tease his younger brother. Right. But, you know, that stuff should be private. I, w I was embarrassed to even hear, hear uh, it must have embarrassed Arlo to, to hear me do that on a record. He never spoke to me about it. I met Bob the uh, second day I was in America, back from six years in Europe. I just got off a ship. I was in Europe for three years, came back for about four months and went back to Europe again for another three years. Been riding around on a scooter with my wife on the back and a guitar and sleeping bag and tent and everything. And we drove that scooter around Europe for two years. We got back to America, I went, went to visit Woody the very first day after a good night's sleep in a hotel went right out to New Jersey to visit Woody and there was Bob Dylan this kid who I didn't know never heard of him. he'd been visiting Woody for about 10 months 
He'd been in New York for 10 months. This is about the year 1961 of uh, November when I came back from Europe. And it wasn't too long before Bob moved into the same hotel where I was staying, the Earl Hotel, guitar picker's home away from home. And that was in uh, Greenwich Village, you know. A lot of the musicians who were playing in town would stay at the Earl Hotel. Ian and Sylvia stayed there. I think Freddie Neal stayed there. They're always, you'd meet a new folk group every other day in the lobby or so, you know, in, in the Earl Hotel. Bob had found out about me and uh, he told me that he had uh, all of my English, I had five or six records out that I recorded in England on Topic label. He had all of those records, he told me and uh, was proceeded to enumerate the songs, you know, and tell me which ones he liked the best and all. So I really felt like I had a, a fan right there. And he soon moved into the hotel right down the hall from me, and we spent quite a lot of time together. Ramblin' Jack Elliott plays guitar in a traditional flat picking style, which he matches with his laconic, humorous storytelling often accompanying himself on harmonica. His singing has a strained nasal quality which the young Bob Dylan emulated. <laughs> did you see that? Did you see Dylan trying to be the I cute? did, but it didn't I didn't notice it very much so much because I thought he, he had a very peculiar style. It was unique and a little strange, but it was to me it was just purely some strange new kid that I just met and I wasn't that aware that he was imitating me but everybody else could see it and they'd they'd poke me and say uh, look at that he's he's <laughs> doing you Jack and I, I remember one day deciding that to not play harmonica anymore because he was doing a, a whole Jack Elliott thing and I thought you know we look like the harmonica brothers and I'm tired of scratching the back of my guitar with this rig I'm taking it off it's yours, and I kind of bequeathed it to him. Oh, really? Maybe that's why I didn't put it together, two and two together, but could be that's one of the reasons why. I started singing a Bob Dylan song one night in an open, an open mic. Don't think twice, it's all right. And he yelled, I release it to you, Jack. <laughs> he was paying me back. I guess, and I never even stopped to wonder about it. I just thought, well, that's nice. I've been singing it ever since. It's a great song. I love it. And it ain't no use in turning on your light, babe. Light I never know. Ain't no use in turning on your light, babe. Cause I'm on the dark side of the road. Still I wish there was something you would do or say To try and make me change my mind and stay We never did too much talking anyway But don't think twice, it's alright <laughs> so I'll just say fairly well. I ain't saying you treated me unkind. You could have done better, but I don't mind. Just kind of wasted my precious time. But don't think twice. 
I don't plan my shows much. Really? Sometimes I just take a, an old set list as a guide. Like I got a set list from a recent show I did with John Prine right. when I got out of the hospital a few months ago. Right. <clears throat> and it was, a, I didn't know, I could, you know, I was just barely getting my fingers back after two strokes, mini strokes. But I was still having a little difficulty playing, especially playing Don't Think Twice, It's All Right, because that's a finger-picking number. And so I had the, I saved the uh, set list from the John Prine show outdoors in a zoo in Portland, Oregon. And I've got that in my guitar case. In case I run out of ideas or have a blackout moment, that can happen, you know, even on stage sometimes. You might just not know what to do. So it's handy to have a little set list. I used to have a big set list with a hundred songs taped on the back of my guitar. And after about 20 years on there, I, I untaped it and it ruined or it removed a lot of the varnish on the back of the guitar because the the, the glue and the scotch tape had been on there for over 10 years. <clears throat> that cardboard, I just got tired of having it all in there, you know, 100 songs. So now I just tape on a little set list with maybe 15 songs. And it's handy to be able to just glance down and see them right there. You grew up in Brooklyn. I didn't grow up. <laughs> I grew up a little bit on the J.E. Ranch over here in yeah, Waverly. Yeah, I can see that. But as a uh, born in Brooklyn, uh, <laughs> did baseball and the Dodgers, was that part of your world? Not at all. It was, but I wasn't interested and didn't like baseball. But I recently met a sound man that used to work sound for me in Marin County nightclubs. Ended up as a disc jockey in uh, Reno and lived moved to Reno they had a baby little kid two years old they his first live music show they brought him to see me performing at the Ash Grove in Los Angeles now that was about 40 years ago the kid grows up to be a professional baseball player pitcher on the Reno team his name was Mike Ellis pitcher so I did the, my imitation of the Brooklyn crowd at Ebbets Field from three miles away up, Lind, up uh, Bedford Avenue when Pee Wee Reese hit a ball out of the park and broke the window in the dry cleaning establishment on Bedford Avenue. This is 20,000 Brooklyn people yelling. He broke out crying in this bar in Virginia City, Nevada, with his mom and dad, my old friend, sound man. That's all I know about baseball. I've only been to about three baseball games in my life. One was at Ebbets Field. Leo DeRocher was yelling. Then I went to a game in Kansas City, Kansas City Royals playing against uh, the Taba T Toronto Maple Leafs, I think it was. Blue Jays. Blue Jays. And the third one was uh, in uh, Oakland, the Oakland A's. Jose, o Jose Canseco. Canseco, yes. <laughs> That's all I know about baseball. How did you get the moniker Ramblin'? Well, there was a gal, a wonderful folk singer, 
from lived in Los Angeles, Odetta, and she was a couple of years younger than me, and she used to come and see me singing at Will Gears Theater up in Topanga Canyon uh, back around 1954. <clears throat> and I had purchased a Model A Ford from an old farmer down in Santa Ana. The engine was rusted shut. You couldn't even crank it. And it took me 10 days to rebuild the engine and get the car running. There was an old man who had about five Model A Fords and he lived right across the street from Odetta's mother. And I'd go to this man's house, oh, about once a week, you know, to, to uh, tune up my brakes or learn how to clean the spark plugs, you know, and learning to be a Model A Ford mechanic there. And he had a group of maybe five or six other people that had Model A's that would congregate there. And I'd spend an hour or two over there, and then I'd go across the street and knock old Ditta's door and uh, was telling her stories about the Model A. It was my biggest adventure at the time. And about the second time I did that, I'm knocking on the door. I've been to see the Model A fella. Now I'm going to go visit Odetta a little bit, knock on the door. <clears throat> well, the first time I went to see Odetta, she was, her mother opened the door and let me in. But didn't know who I was. I introduced myself. I said I was a friend of Odetta's. She said, you can wait here in the living room. Odetta is having a bath. So I sat and waited and I could hear Odetta splashing in the bathtub down the hall, singing to herself. After about 45 minutes, it was getting pretty long time and I'm getting bored. I went down the hall and I spoke to Odetta through the door, told her all about my Model A Ford and everything. So the next time I come see Odetta, I knock on the door her mother's looking through the peephole, you know, and she saw who it was. And I, she opened the door a, a little bit, and I heard her, she turned around and she yelled, Oh, Detta, Ramblin' Jack is here. <laughs> so I got a new name. You're fantastic. This is great.